Hi, I'm Wayne Cousins. I'm Ramona Marr, and this is World Stage 86, your weekly passport to Expo and Centennial events. This week, we'll look at the marketing of Expo, a massive campaign underway to sell the fair to North America. We'll also travel Highway 86, a fascinating road to nowhere that is already a controversial project. Chinese New Year's with us, and we'll celebrate by taking a look at a little Chinatown history. But first, we'll explore an Expo pavilion that means a lot to all of us. While many Expo buildings are empty shells right now, Bill Dobson found one that is already on its way to completion. He wandered inside and found himself in the woods. There's no doubt in the world where I am. With a forest like this, it just has to be British Columbia. And it's through woods like these that you'll enter and leave the BC Pavilion at Expo 86. And when you're going through that pavilion, you'll see vistas and parts of British Columbia you've never seen before, no matter how long you've lived here. The objective of the BC Pavilion is to bring visitors and residents a taste of this province that they couldn't get if they traveled all year. And it comes in a fascinating variety of presentations. One of the first exhibits you'll see is the 500-seat Showscan Theater. The man walking in with me is Rod Cameron. He's in charge of public relations for the BC Pavilion, and he explained to me what the Showscan Theater will do. Here we're going to do a high-speed uh, adventure tour through the province um, in film. We're going to be doing it through a system called Showscan, which lends itself very, very well to handling high-resolution and a lot of action. And uh, we'll be going through virtually all parts of the province in conjunction with a little girl by the name of Feruza Balk, who did a uh, return uh, to Oz with Disney and is going to be working in this film with us as well. Uh, what people will see is all parts of British Columbia, uh, but they'll be seeing it in a way that will be a little unusual. Uh, they will have many unusual perspectives. We'll be looking at things that are unique, that are unknown. Uh, so that we hope we'll create an experience that will be every bit as exciting for people from BC as for people who are coming here as visitors and perhaps don't know very much about the province. Now, once the audience leaves this theater, what's the next stop? Uh, the most spectacular choice will be right directly in front of them. This is a series of exhibits we're calling the Trees of Discovery. The Trees of Discovery are vertical towers up to 65, 70 feet in height, uh, where we have organized the exhibits to be seen by the viewer riding an elevator up the center of these towers. Uh, and on the edges of the towers are a series of modules. In those modules will be different components, audiovisual, dioramas, and so forth. I understand one of them is particularly spectacular undersea. Yes. Uh, the submersible area, the undersea area, is an area of BC technology that we're particularly proud of, and we discovered that we're uh, very, very much on the leading edge of world technology in this area, so we wanted to treat it specially. So rather than simply having an exhibit presentation or a visual presentation, we have created a simulator, and the uh, visitors in this particular unit will be able to take a simulated voyage uh, in the submersible down to a great depth and participate in, the, in a, a rescue sequence. Uh, in the course of doing that, we'll be explaining a great deal about these vessels and their activities, but it'll all be from, from the perspective of a participant rather than someone simply watching. On the surface at the dock will be real boats. On the shore, there'll be real loggers and logger sports. And everywhere, there'll be real entertainment. From the BC Pavilion of Discovery for World Stage 86, I'm Bill Dobson. The growth of Vancouver in this past century has been fed by immigration from many different parts of the world. This centennial year seems like a good time to explore the roots of our city's major ethnic communities. This week, we'll take a look at one of the largest and most visible. Vancouver's Chinatown is much more than a place to watch a lion's dance, have dim sum, or buy a wicker basket. 
Since the Chinese began arriving in B.C. in the 1850s, the Chinese-Canadian community has grown to be a vital part of this city. No one knows that better than Paul Yi, a Vancouver archivist, historian, and writer, and a third-generation Chinese-Canadian himself. Paul, literature and uh, history books will tell us that the Chinese began arriving to B.C. in about the 1850s. Why did they start coming here? First of all, it was for the gold rush, uh, first on the Fraser River, then up in the Caribou country. And after the gold rushes had petered out, the Chinese began moving into other primary industries throughout the province, things like coal mining, um, sawmill, salmon cannery, and then in the 1880s, there was a big influx of Chinese for building the railroad. What sorts of things did they do to make a living? Well, in Vancouver, there are all kinds of things the Chinese could do. They worked as, the sawmills were a major employer here. The Chinese worked as um, houseboys and cooks in the hotels. They worked on the steamboats that went up and down the coast for Union steamships and also on the CPR line. Vancouver was the port where the goods from China were shipped through to the interior. And one of the most famous merchants in Chinatown was Yip Sang, who owned the Wing Sang building. And his building here was one of the very first brick buildings built in Chinatown. And he used to have a rice mill in the back and stables in the back, as well as um, Foss Creek used to come right in front of his building so he could load the goods right up to um, the second floor of his storage area. A lot of bachelor men came, so how did they cope in terms of not having their families or wives or mothers and fathers there? No, it wasn't easy. I guess for them it was like, this is for the family. I'm here to make money. I'll send the money back. Um, to live here for them, I think they clung together. They had um, different kinds of associations that men joined and could spend time together and take care of each other. Um, the Chinese Benevolent Association was one of them, and I guess they're most remembered for their role during hard times. Chinatown has changed over the past many years. How has it changed? Most recently, since the 1970s, it's changed because massive waves of new immigrants from all around the world have been coming to Vancouver, and these are Chinese from Southeast Asia, Chinese from Africa, Chinese from South America. So the composition of the community has changed. And in Chinatown, physically, you can see that most readily with new kinds of shops that are here. Music shops, the new eateries, and I guess this building here, the Chinese Culture Center, represents that growth and that change too. It's sort of the coming together of all these different generations, these different kinds of Chinese on a common project. So the Chinese Culture Center was over 10 years in planning. It's still under construction, it's still fundraising, and it's still going to continue to change Chinatown. Everyone knows about the commercial part of Chinatown, but what people don't really see is Strathcona, the neighborhood where people live. What's the relationship between Strathcona and Chinatown? Well, Chinatown's always had a residential component, but for the families, Strathcona was much more appealing because it had, you know, single detached houses. And as well, the school was here, so the, the kids who needed to go to elementary school would always go through Strathcona. And then, in the 60s, when the city of Vancouver was going through urban renewal and freeway planning, both Strathcona and Chinatown were kind of slated for destruction. Mm. And it was only through sort of massive kinds of community protests that those plans were halted. So Strathcona has survived. It's really grown lately. It's a very trendy area to live in now. I mean, this co-op is a sign of renewed energy, people wanting to live in a neighborhood right. in the inner city. Right. So the amazing thing about Strathcona and people who live in Strathcona is that they put up with this incredible parking problem that Chinatown generates. I don't think any other neighborhood in town would put up with it. I mean, the people who live around the PE or the VGH, they're always complaining and you need a permit to park there, but Strathcona, well, it's a way of life. People accept it. On the historic and busy streets of Chinatown, I'm Ramona Marr. Head on world stage, the selling of Expo 86. And a trip along Highway 86. You can walk on it, but no driving, please. At CGOR 600, we noticed a lot of hype on the radio dial. So we chose News Talk. No hoopla, just what you need to know presented with style. Why not try us for a week? Wake up with us. Drive to work with us. If you don't like it, well, you can always go back to the hype. But we think you'll agree. CJOR 600 is the intelligent choice. 
great news from your greater Vancouver Lincoln Mercury dealers. Buy a brand new Lynx for only $78.95 and get $500 cash back from Ford. That's right, a front wheel drive Lynx with rack and pinion steering, power brakes, steel belted radios, rear window washer wiper, AM FM stereo cassette, and much, much more. Only $78.95 less $500 now at Dam's Lincoln Mercury in Surrey, New West Lincoln Mercury in New Westminster, Toto Mercury in Vancouver, and Zephyr on Broadway. This offer good for a limited time only. British Columbia entered Prohibition on December 20th, 1916. Right away, the dry squad raided hundreds of bootleggers. But bottles were hidden under turbans. Doctors prescribed alcohol for medicinal purposes. It always was for me. And the police offered a dollar an hour plus free smells of the bottle for those who would help move the seized liquor. In 1920, a plebiscite brought an end to Prohibition and a government monopoly over the liquor business. The government got richer, and the drinkers got drunk, but poorer. It would be hard for us in Vancouver to go about our daily lives not knowing that Expo will be with us in May. But what about the rest of the world? Do they know? And if not, how will they find out? Here's Bill Dobson. You know, these days when I watch TV, I often think, boy, are they plugging the heck out of Expo. Come on, BC. Invite the world. But what about the rest of Canada and the whole United States and uh, the rest of the world, for that matter? Are they getting the message? I think so. The 20-foot logo on the tail of the CP Air 747 was seen on four continents in the first week. Inside, the passengers will be seeing an in-flight TV promotion. The Expo logo is on the products and vehicles of all the many corporate sponsors, and many of these are seen around the world. Michael Powell, Expo's Director of Advertising, says the marketing plan was drawn up after a lot of research. We found, for instance, that in uh, British Columbia, there's a, um, there's a sense of pride and a little bit of awe, too, that we are going to be the focus of attention to the world. Uh, when we got into Ontario, we got some confusion as to why a World Fair would be held here, but nevertheless, uh, if it's going to be world class, uh, then they would be interested. Come on it's marvelous. Come on when we got into Montreal, we found that uh, they just remember Expo 67 and the impact that it had on that city. Superb. Things that work in, um, in Ontario, for instance, aren't going to work in California. You'll love it! Come join us! And that's an order. Mr. Powell didn't mention Texas as one of the target areas, but I have a broadcaster friend in Dallas. His name is Alex Burton. I thought I'd phone him and find out just what he's heard about Expo 86. I met a fellow the other day who had been to Vancouver, and he said, you've got to go to Vancouver for Expo 86. And I said, why is this? And he said, the Canadians are farther along with their expo at this moment than New Orleans was on the day that they opened in New Orleans. And I said, well, that's just got old Canadian know-how. It just looks like a quality, a quality production all the way down the line, Bill. Well-known BC broadcaster Chuck Davis publishes a weekly newsletter called Expo Pulse, and he does daily Expo Update broadcasts, and they're oh, yes. syndicated. Oh, my, yes. Yeah, we're at 21 stations now, and we think at the rate we're going, we'll probably be near 60 by the time Expo opens, and uh, they tell me that once Expo starts, that's when you can see a, a quantum leap. So uh, it looks, the radio show looks very, very good, yeah. You know, the real proof of the campaign focuses right here in the Expo Info Center in Vancouver, where they're, right now, at this period of time, they're taking up to 1,500 calls a day and answering up to 1,000 letters a day. Expo 86, Dan Abel speaking. Yes, Dan, I need to get some information on uh, uh, day passes. Yes, what would you like to know? Um, first, the price. Okay, where are you calling from? Sacramento, California. Oh, it could be $15 a day in American funds. This is where the calls come to on the toll-free numbers. They come from everywhere, and they're here at all hours. At the peak of the demand, once Expo's underway, they'll be ready with at least 40 people at this information center. 
But this much reaction this early seems to be a good omen for Expo 86. Come on out. And that's an order. From the Expo Info Center for World Stage 86, I'm Bill Dobson. Some people dream of leaving a mark on the city they live in, a kind of reaching for immortality, but few of us manage to fulfill that dream. This week on My Vancouver, a man who definitely has made his mark, and in a very visible way. He's Vancouver real estate developer, Andre Molnar. Buildings reflect the culture of the surrounding and the culture of the people who live in them, and I think uh, the strong demand and the from the population of the Vancouverites to live in a very upbeat, uh, new architectural uh, style and the desire to live in that, uh, that kind of environment, I think is very positive because we couldn't build them if the people wouldn't buy them. And uh, for me, it is very challenging because I love what I am doing because I'm doing the kind of buildings which I enjoy to build. I think it's wonderful that uh, the type of architecture I dream up and work uh, uh, and then build actually are very well received in the marketplace and that of course uh, credit to the people who, who buy them and live in them. I think I experienced the last phase of a frontier town becoming a world-class city and I am very happy and proud to be part of that and uh, I was fortunate to come here at a young age I did and uh, I enjoyed every minute of it, and I think that I, I was at the right place at the right time, and there's an added bonus that Vancouver is a gorgeous, beautiful city as far as the location and the geographics are concerned. And uh, the mixture of all, of course, uh, gave me the happiest uh, 20 years of my life. One of the most unusual and expensive exhibits on the Expo site is a sculpture called Highway 86. But if the word sculpture makes you think of Michelangelo or Henry Moore, think again. Highway 86 is nothing like that. The highway itself is a kind of a monumental piece of environmental art integrated with the plaza, which is the central space of the fair. And our idea was to somehow embody the whole theme of the fair, the feeling of transportation and communication. There are controversial elements, maybe, in the terms of the, the sense of, uh, is it, you know, kind of after the apocalypse or before the apocalypse? And I mean, things like that might be considered controversial. It emerges sort of like uh, Darwin's theory of evolution, really. And it's uh, transportation uh, vehicles from 1940 to the present, uh, a kind of a history, not, not in any sequence, but more or less an evolution. There is a airplane coming from the water and some vehicles immediately. And you come here, you see, you know, fire engines, motorcycles. We try to obviously compose the elements so there's a kind of a juxtaposition between these very fragile uh, ingredients and then the masses of some of the others and you just keep weaving along so in a sense things are all going in one direction they all seem to be going to their I, I guess towards the future after you ride the buckling highway you arrive finally at the end and uh, the last section of the highway shoots up under the Georgia viaduct and then breaks off in space and then there's going to be a symbol car uh, at the end of the highway uh, which will just, in a sense, fly to the future, we hope. That's the way it'll work. Many architects are very bothered by the fact that we deal so much with psychology, with the human mind. And, and in a sense, you play games with uh, conscious and unconscious thought. So, you know, people don't like that. I, you know, some people don't. And other people, as I think you'll see when this project is finished, I think a lot of people will respond very favorably. If you're gonna do public art it has to take into public consciousness or public sensibility and i think people today have an ambivalent feeling between what they see as technology it used to be the hope for mankind i mean you know 
1889 fair, technology was going to save the world. Now we're in a more mature position. This is a cautious view of technology, as well as a celebration. I don't think art changes the world. I have no, I don't think it, uh, you know, there was a pretense with modernism that we're going to change the world. I think now we're mature enough as a, as a world to see that you don't change the world, but well, you can influence the way people think about things. And there should be, I guess, a kind of memory, uh, an ambivalent memory that they take away, a thoughtful memory, like what does it all mean anyway? What does transportation and all this technology and, because there are clearly bad sides. There's clearly, you know, in, in this point in time, there's really the threat of the end of, of the world built into the technological matrix. And um, so I think a lot of those thoughtful things should go with them as well as having had a great time. I think it's going to be at its best when it's just absolutely saturated with kids. I mean, that's going to be a, you know, a great day for this, this project. Still to come, 86 days and counting. The World's Fair will soon be here. The last thing you want is something the cat dragged in, like a complicated registered retirement savings plan. Well, at Van City, ours still has no strings attached. No startup charges, no closeout fees, no commissions, no penalties. What Van City's RRSP does give you is one of the best interest rates available on a variable or fixed term plan. Come see us about yours, a safe, secure option that lets you sleep at night. We're over 50 acres of GM, Ford, Chrysler, Sports, all make imports, cars, and light trucks. Millions and millions of parts. Why pay top price for new auto parts when you can buy recycled parts, many near new, for half or less, with our exclusive 120-day guarantee? Motors, transmissions, rear ends, rotors, brake drums, alternators. If an auto has it, United Auto have it. Canada's largest recycled auto parts shopping center. United Used Auto Parts, Scott Road, Surrey. Budget Rent-A-Car has teamed up with the Keg to bring you this terrific offer. The next time you rent any GM car or truck from Budget from only $9.95 a day, you'll get a free Keg steak on us. At Budget, you'll get the right car at the right price, plus a free Keg steak certificate at participating Budget locations. And now open, next to the Fraser Arms where Granville meets Marine, Budget Rental Car Sales. All cars have been BCAA inspected, trades, financing, and warranty all available from Budget Rental Car Sales. At Budget, your number one. There are hundreds of body shops out there. The one you choose may be a more important decision than you think. At Kern Collision, customers bring all makes to us because of our state-of-the-art equipment, over a quarter of a million dollars worth. The Kern Collision factory process paint job is only available here, and we guarantee it. In fact, we guarantee that only the most modern equipment is used to restore your car to its original shape. That's right, this is Charlie Chaplin. Did you know that he played here in Vancouver twice? He played at the Alhambra Theater that used to be at Pender and Howe. The interesting thing is it was rumored that Charlie's movie contract was signed here in Vancouver following a performance with Stan Laurel on February the 6th, 1913. You know, I think he began to walk funny so he wouldn't slip on a rain-soaked Vancouver street. Expo 86 is now 86 days away. The countdown is on to a great event. Is Vancouver ready? Are you ready? I'm really excited about it coming on. Just having had our pictures done for the passes and really, I think it's going to be really exciting. I think it'll be all right. I think it'll be good for the city and the economy and everything and looking forward to it. Well, I think it'll uh, bring a lot of tourists, of course, but also I think uh, they'll come back another time. Many, many people don't know we exist, you know, <laughs> particularly some of the Americans. I feel very good about it. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. I was a little worried at first people were saying uh, to boycott it, but I'm thinking the best thing to do is for everybody to go so that we don't have to pay for it after. Well, I hope that it brings lots of prosperity because we sure need it for the 
especially in the construction and the, in the end of the day. Oh, yes, we've got three-day passes. My dad gave them to everybody for Christmas, and uh, we're looking forward to it. So It's going to bring a lot of people and a lot of money into the city and give us a chance to experience what Vancouver's all about, meeting people. I think it's great. I'm an American, and I've married a Canadian, been up here uh, going on six years, and I know a lot of my family and uh, friends are coming up for it. I think it's fantastic. Oh, it's definitely going to boost the economy for the the year definitely oh we're going to have a lot of people visiting from around the world and other provinces and i think a lot of people are going to see how beautiful vancouver is for the first time well i think it'll do uh, good things for british columbia i'm sure it will well i think it'll be fantastic i hope it makes me three times as busy as i am now i think it's going to be a wonderful show and i'm all for it the uh, we have friends coming from connecticut and also from california and Oregon, so I imagine we'll have a great time. Are you going to Expo? No. If you have some questions or comments about our show, please feel free to write us. Here's our address, World Stage 86, CBC Television, Post Office Box 4600, Vancouver, B.C., V6B4A2. We'd be delighted to hear from you. Next week on World Stage 86, Headlines of the Century, a Vancouver perspective on the big news stories, as told to us by our Vancouver newspapers. And we'll preview the visit to Vancouver of Prince Charles and Princess Diana during the opening week of Expo, where they'll go, what they'll do, and how you might get a chance to see them. All that and lots more, too, on our next show. I'd like to wish you, Ramona, a happy Year of the Tiger. And the same to you, too. For World Stage 86, I'm Wayne Cousins. And I'm Ramona Marr. See you next week.